In part 1, we make an initial examination of the holiness of God. What is holiness? We emphasize that a correct revelation of His nature will evoke the right response from us toward God and draw us to the place where His nature is reproduced in us and revealed through us. So let's rise up to our feet this morning. We're going to say what God has said about us in His Word. So let's hold our Bibles high up in the air. Make this declaration loud, bold, strong and clear. This is God's Word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe His word. And I live by His word. Christ is my master. And to Him, I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Why don't you turn around to people next to you, in front of you, behind you. Wish them, greet them, shake hands, smile at them. Give them your name. And then you may be seated, please. All right, turn around to your neighbor and say, Agios, O Dios. Now tell the person on the other side, Agios, O Dios. So what you've just told them is, Holy God. God is holy. (laughs) Amen. So this morning, uh, we're going to spend four Sundays, starting today, just talking about the holiness of God. Of God, the holiness of God, Agios Otheos, our holy God. This morning we kind of begin an introduction to just start exploring this whole realm of the holiness of God. We'll build on it next Sunday. Pastor Kumar will be ministering here next Sunday, so we'll build on that further on the holiness of God. And then on the third Sunday, we'll talk about. His holiness in me. How does God's holiness become part of us? How do we become holy? What does it mean? Uh, and we'll, we'll delve into that on third Sunday, third Sunday from now. And the fourth Sunday, we'll talk about the beauty of holiness, in, in the beauty of holiness, how we engage uh, in worship, how we engage in our ministry, in, in, in worshiping God, in this, this holy God. We'll talk about being in the beauty of holiness. So as we introduce this subject on the holiness of God, it's quite obvious that God is holy. I mean, we don't have to reiterate it or state it even. Many of us understand, recognize God is holy. But to be very biblical, let's read at least two verses. (laughs) Psalm 99, verse 5 and verse 9. Let's start from there. Psalm 99, verse 5 says, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. Verse 9, the same psalm says, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill. For the Lord our God is holy. Holy, Agios Otheos, Holy God. God is holy. You know, there are various facets to the nature of God, to the character of God. God is a good God. Now that's very important for us to understand because sometimes many of us think God is a bad God. (laughs) So it's important to understand that aspect of God's nature. God is a good God. Now, every revelation we have about the nature of God evokes a response from us. So we respond to that. God's a good God, so I, 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 I rest in His goodness. I'm assured of His goodness. 
But then also, that quality or that nature of God, that character of God, God desires it to be reproduced in us and also revealed through us. So there's revelation, there's response, there's it being reproduced in us and it being revealed through us. God is a good God, so I rest in that goodness, but I also learn to be good, to, good or kind to other people so that his goodness is revealed through us. Same thing about the love of God. He's a father. He loves us as a father loves us. So we rest assured in the father's love. But then we also release father's love to other people, love other people as we are loved. So like this, there are various facets to the nature of God, and we are familiar with several of them. God is a God who heals, God is a God who provides, and so that evokes a response from us, but God desires that to be built into us, reproduced in us, and also revealed through us. And the same with this aspect of God, the holiness of God, that God is a holy God. Now, our desire, now we must grow in our knowledge of God. Our desire is to know Him for who He really is. What is an idol? An idol is something that takes the place of God, but an idol could also be something that misrepresents God. So many Christians have idols. They have a wrong picture of God, and that wrong picture of God is an idol because it misrepresents God to them to us. Are you with me? So it's very important to have an accurate understanding, a clear understanding, a full understanding of who God is. Otherwise we end up with an idol. We think we know God, but we actually have a misrepresented God, and that is an idol. So it's important to have a correct knowledge of God. And, but how do we gain a correct knowledge of God? It doesn't come just through academic or intellectual effort. Paul tells us in Ephesians 1 and verse 17, he says, And I pray that God will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Yeah. So it takes the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of wisdom and revelation, the God who reveals to make God known to us that we may know Him. Amen? The Holy Spirit is the one who makes God known to us, helps us know Him. And so as we go through these four Sundays, and not just these four Sundays, but all the time, you and I should pray, God, give us a greater revelation of who you are. And not just greater, but a correct revelation. I want to know you for who you really are. I don't want a wrong picture of God. I want to have a correct picture of God. So, one of the facets of God's nature is, He's a holy God. So let's state this. A correct revelation of His nature will evoke the correct or the right kind of response from us that draws us to Him. And then, that aspect of his nature is reproduced in us and is revealed through us. You with me? So that revelation of God is very important. We need to have a correct revelation of God so that we have the right response to him. And we're drawn to him. And that is reproduced in us and then revealed through us so people can see that aspect of God's nature in us. So, every facet of God's nature is equally important. We don't want to emphasize one and pretend the other doesn't exist. Every aspect of His nature is equally important. And as much as we talk about the goodness of God, we also have to talk about the holiness of God. They're both equally important. So that's what we want to do in this series. And just to get us beginning to explore this aspect of God's nature, I'd like us to go to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, and consider Isaiah as he has a personal revelation of God through a vision. And we want to just understand a few things 
from his encounter with God, just to get started. So Isaiah chapter 6, we'll begin with verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. So he's having a vision. He's having an encounter with God. I saw the Lord, Adonai, sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. It says, in the year the king Uzziah died, so the land was without a king. The king died. But he had a vision and he saw another king. But this king was the king, the highest king. I saw Adonai. Adonai is sovereign God. He saw the Lord, Adonai. Seated on his throne, king. High and lifted up, exalted, means this is the highest throne I saw him. So in one way God is saying, there's no king down there, but I'm here. I'm here. I'm king. I'm Adonai. And it's interesting, he sees the train of his robe filled the temple. What does that mean? You know, in old times, kings and queens, they purposely wore long robes. That's the train of their rope. So they would have 25 people carrying the rope. So they walk majestically and all these people carrying the rope. You know, nowadays in weddings you have, sometimes you have some, you know, brides would wear a little robe and they have a little train. <laughs> but here he saw the train of his robe was so big, it covered the whole Temple. So imagine somebody standing up here and they have a, such a long robe, it covers this whole hall. Something like that. That's what he was picturing. He saw. The train of his robe filled the temple. Now, that robe, the train of the robe, really talked about majesty, talked about the grandeur of the king. The king is putting his strength and power and majesty on display. You know, this is how great I am. So the picture here is he's seeing Adonai, God who is king on the throne and, and all of the temple is covered with his majesty. And then he sees in verse 2, above it stood seraphim. These are worshipping angels, angelic beings. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. It's very interesting to see that in this verse, when he says Lord, he uses a different word. He uses Jehovah, the eternal, self-existent, I am God. Adonai. Sovereign God on the throne. But Jehovah, he's using a different title. This is God. And he's saying he is holy, holy, holy. The point I want to emphasize here is that when he's talking about Jehovah God, God as Jehovah, the eternal one, the very nature of God, he is holy, holy. Holy. Next Sunday we'll see why in heaven they say holy, holy, holy. Come back next Sunday. <laughs> but for today, the point is, the very nature of Jehovah is holiness. Sovereign God on the throne, but this God is holy his very nature is holy and the whole earth is covered with his glory verse 4 and the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out and the house was filled with smoke now what happens when isaiah has a revelation of a vision of the holiness of god what response is evoked? So revelation causes a response. What is a response? Verse 5. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone. 
Because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So what is his response? Revelation evokes a response. His first response is, I'm unfit. I'm unclean. I shouldn't be anywhere here before such a holy God. I am undone. That word undone in Hebrew has two, two meanings to it. One is I am speechless. I'm silent. I'm dumb. I have nothing to say. The other part of that meaning, the word un, undone is I'm laid low. I can't do anything. I'm struck down. So basically he's saying, I'm speechless and there's nothing I can do. I am undone. Nothing to say, nothing to do. When I see God like this. But some beautiful things happen from there on. Next verse says, Then one of the seraphim, Flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is purged. So God is saying, I will do something for you that will make you fit to stand in my He is so holy, none of us on our own can stand in his presence. He, real, he realizes that I am unclean and he says, hey, everybody else is in the same boat. We are all unclean. We, we have no right to stand before such a king and such a God. But then God does something. He provides something. He says, I am providing you the cleansing. You are now clean because this has touched you. And I have removed your iniquity and I have taken away your of sin. Your iniquity is your inclination to sin. Your propensity to sin. The evil that's within us that causes us to sin. And your sin, the deeds you've done is purged. I've dealt with both. So when we understand the holiness of God, we are so grateful that he has given us the ability to actually stand and worship him. He gives us that ability. Amen? In our own selves, we are undone. Nothing to say, nothing to do. But he gives us the grace. He says, I make you fit. I remove whatever makes you unclean. I do it for you. And what happens next? Then, the next verse. I also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Ah, God is sharing his heart. Isaiah, there's something on my heart. I shared with you. So God is such a holy God. He makes you and me fit to stand in His presence. Not only does He make you and me fit to stand in His presence, but He says, I want to share my heart. And this is what's, what was in God's heart at that time. Who will go? Whom shall I send? And as I says, here I am, send me. And now, as I has the opportunity to partner with God in His mission. So such a holy God, He makes us clean. He shares His heart with us. And He also makes us partners with Him in His mission. Amen? But it seems to me that all of us need to have a revelation of the holiness of God. To appreciate, to truly appreciate what God has done for us in Christ. Making us fit to stand in His presence, making us fit to hear His voice, and making us partners with Him in His mission. Amen? Are you with me so far? So, 
a revelation of God's holiness. What we also want to emphasize, which we will cover further in the coming Sundays, is that God wants that aspect of His holiness, that His holiness to be reproduced in us. And let me just touch upon this very quickly. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16, Peter says, Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance. In other words, don't live the way you used to live. Verse 15. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. So, he is holy. Now he wants his nature to be reproduced in us. So he says, be holy, because I am who he is should become part of who we are reproduced in us. And this is just you know, one place reference in the Old Te Testament, Leviticus 19, verse 2. God tells Moses, you speak to all the congregation of children of Israel, say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. So as we, and this is what we seek to achieve in, in, in this whole series of, 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 of talking about the holiness of God, that as we Receive a revelation of that holiness. Everything in us that is opposite to His holiness will find it repulsive. And let it be driven away out of our lives. And let us be drawn towards His holiness so that that is reproduced in us and then revealed through us. Are you with me? Some of you are. <laughs> so, what is holiness? What is this thing? What is holiness? It is the very nature of God. And it is the core aspect of His nature. We will emphasize that next Sunday. But if you want to talk about holiness, and what is this? holiness of God. We can try to articulate it in this manner. It is absolute sinlessness. It is absolute purity. It is absolute truth because anything that's a lie cannot be part of holiness. It is absolute faithfulness because anything that breaks covenant or breaks word cannot be part of God's nature. It's absolute justice or justice and righteousness are the same word, the, the original word in Hebrew is justice and righteous, just and righteous, same word. It's absolute justice. It's absolute love because love does not rejoice in sin and therefore cannot be part of God's holiness. It is absolute goodness. Anything unkind cannot be part of holiness. It's absolutely sacred. Anything profane cannot be part of His holiness. It's absolute perfection. So holiness, it's the very nature of God and it's that aspect of God's nature that is mingled with every other facet of His nature. Holiness is the very nature of God and it's that part of His nature that is mingled with every other facet. He's holy, His love, His love flows out of His holiness. His good flows out of His holiness. It's His core nature. Every facet of God's nature is mingled with holiness. Perfect. Perfection. His love is sinless. His goodness is also holy. That means in His goodness, He will not compromise holiness. He's merciful, but His mercy is undergirded with holiness. In His mercy, He will not compromise holiness. Are you with me? So every facet of the nature of God is mingled with holiness. This is the core aspect of God's nature. Now, for God, that's His nature. But what about holiness of created things like you and me? And in the Bible, and we will see this later on, that 
God designates certain things like holy. He designates certain days as holy. Certain places as holy. First and foremost as people as holy. In the Old Testament, the utensils were holy. So what about the holiness of created things? Now, the Hebrew and the Greek words for holiness are holy. Are whole, mean holy and pure. But when they're used in respect to created things, people and other things, the derived meaning simply means to be consecrated, to be set apart, to be sanctified. So the holiness that you and I have is bestowed on us. It is what we have derived because God gives it to us. Are you with me? His is by nature. That's who he is. But what the holiness you and I have is bestowed on us. God gives it to us. But what does it mean as far as you and I are concerned? It means we are set apart for God. So holiness for you and me is our willingness to be set apart for the one who is most holy. That's holiness as far as you and I are concerned. Are you with me? Our willingness, we want to use a technical term, our willingness to be sanctified or consecrated. I'm saying, God, you're holy. I want to be completely yours. So I set myself apart unto you. That's holiness. For you and me. You understand? Our, that's holiness in your life and mine. Our willingness to be completely set apart for the one who is holy. He is holy by nature. You and I derive our holiness from him. Because we choose to be completely set apart unto him. That's holiness. But here's the important thing I want to talk about. And we will stress on part three of the sermon. Is holiness is first and foremost a heart thing. Because the moment we talk about holiness, everybody thinks about don't smoke, don't drink, don't chew and pan, don't spit, don't kick the cat, all this. Thing. I mean, hey, don't put the cart before the horse. Holiness is first and foremost internal. It's the nature of God. So it's to be first and foremost part of our nature. And from there, it will touch these other areas of our lives. Are you with me? So don't start jumping on the externals. He doesn't smell holy. Doesn't look holy. Hey. Once it gets inside them, it will show up on the... So give them some time. You understand? Because holiness is first and foremost the nature of God. And as we willingly set ourse us ourselves apart unto Him, and it becomes part of our nature, then it will begin to touch all other aspects of our lives. It starts from inside out. Keep that thought Bring it with you on the third Sunday. <laughs> I'm just joking. Here's another thing about the holiness of God. Another way to look at it. Holiness is God's beauty. It's God's glory and beauty. And if you look at the way the word holy is used, and I'll just pick one example here in Exodus 28 verse 2. Uh, God is telling Moses about how, you know, what clothes to give the priests. And he says in Exodus 28 verse 2, you shall make holy garments for Aaron. Aaron was going to be the priest. So you will make holy garments for Aaron, your brother. But why? Give him holy garments. For glory and for 
holiness, glory and beauty. In other places and in, in the Bible you'll always see holiness associated with beauty. Some examples, Psalm 29 verse 2. Give unto the Lord the glory to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of You find many other references. I'll give one more. Psalm 96 verse 9. Or oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of So, there are many, many metaphors used in the Bible in relation to God to just kind of reveal some aspect of Him in our language. So, for instance, you will find many places in the Bible the arm of the Lord. What does the arm of the Lord mean? I know it's the hand of the Lord. What does the hand of the Lord mean? Strength, power. The eye of the Lord. The Bible says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro across the whole earth. Seeking whom he may show himself strong. On their behalf. So his eyes. Of the, so of course running. <laughs> what is, what is a, it's a metaphor. But what does the eye of the Lord mean? It's describing his omniscience. He knows everything. Doesn't have CCTV cameras everywhere. <laughs> no. The eye of the Lord. It's his omniscience. Are you with me? So like this there are many. Talks about the feet of the Lord. His footstool and so on and so forth. The beauty of God is His holiness. The beauty of God, His excellence, His good looks, His attractiveness. The beauty of God is His holiness. So holiness should draw us to God, not repel us from God. You with me? Because that's the beauty of the Lord. That's His attractiveness. That's His magnificence, His grandeur, His... I don't know what words you can use. His beauty. That's holiness. Holiness is the beauty of the Lord. His splendor is perfections. So how holy is God? Exodus 15.11 says he is glorious in holiness. Just great. Or 1 Samuel 2.2 2, No one is holy like the Lord. So really, there are no words our words are insufficient to try and express the, the holiness of God. So in these four Sundays, we talk about the holiness of God. Everything we try to attempt to do is just so minute compared to what His holiness is really all about. And that's why we need the revelation of the Holy Spirit, what the Spirit of God puts in our hearts beyond what human words communicate or articulate. It's beyond what we can comprehend and explain. But this is interesting, this is important. That knowing God in His holiness is the place of the fear of God. Knowing God in His holiness is the place of the fear of God. I mean, it's reverence for God. Fear is an old word, but just that's where reverence of God begins. And it's in that place that you have wisdom and understanding. Probably the reason why there is no fear of God is probably because we have not received a revelation of the knowledge of the holy. Right? Proverbs 29, Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
What is the fear of the Lord? The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Now, usually when they write Psalms and Proverbs, it's are two statements. They're saying the same thing in different words. So the fear of the Lord is the knowledge of the Holy One. What will it lead us into? Wisdom and understanding. So the knowledge of the Holy One, that's the place. When you have a revelation of the Holy One, that's the place where reverence for God begins. And that is also the place where wisdom and understanding begins. Amen? So the knowledge of the Holy One is so important for us. All holiness is measured in relation to Him. He is absolutely Perfectly holy. I'll just close with two more thoughts here. What about the holiness and goodness of God? The holiness and goodness of God. Like we said earlier, every facet of God's nature, even His goodness, is mingled with holiness. God can never be good in the sense of compromising His can never, never. can never do that. So Romans 2 verse 4 says, Don't you know that His goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, that the goodness of God leads us to? The goodness of God is not a license to go in sin. The goodness of God draws us to holiness. Are you with me? Unfortunately, in some circles, the grace of God, the goodness of God is presented in such a manner that Chalo, jo bhi chahi, karo. <laughs> whatever you want, you do. And whatever you want, you do. Hey, the goodness of God is not a license to go in sin. The goodness of God is is actually a drawing into His holiness. The goodness of God leads us to repentance, closer to God. Now, we must understand both aspects of the nature of God, the holiness of God and the goodness of God. We must understand that both these have a meeting point, a meeting place. For instance, in Romans 11, verses 21 and 22, Paul writes to the church, he says, if God did not spare the natural branches, talking about the Jews, he may not spare you either, the Gentiles, who were brought into faith. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who felt severity, but toward you goodness, if you... Continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. He's talking to believers. Or in James 2.13. For judgment is without mercy to those who have shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, you must understand. That in God, there is a place. Where mercy, the goodness of God meets with the severity of God. Mercy meets judgment. Grace meets truth. Holiness meets goodness. And mercy will always triumph over judgment provided if we walk towards repentance. Are you with me? There's a place where mercy meets judgment. Goodness meets severity. Holiness meets God's goodness. In God. So we can never emphasize one without the other. Because every facet of God's nature comes mingled with holiness. Are you understanding this? So I can never talk about God's goodness as a license just to keep doing what I want. There is a place... A mercy will meet judgment. 
But God's intent is that mercy always triumphs over judgment, provided I repent, I go towards His goodness. So as we just close this introduction this morning, what if you and I were to meet with the Holy God? We saw Isaiah's response. He said, God, I am undone. Nothing to say, nothing I can do. You're overwhelming. Several others have had a similar response when, when Jacob woke up from this dream and it, we just had this dream of God appearing to him and God speaking to him. He says, how awesome is this place. Wow. Fearful, dreadful, full of reverence. And God appeared to him in the burning bush. God told Moses, Moses, don't come near. Take your shoes off. Where you're standing is holy. Later on in Exodus 33, when Moses saw the back of God, the backside of God, the Bible says he bowed his head to the earth and worshipped. Other people like Ezekiel and Daniel and John, when they had a revelation of God, the Bible says they were down on the ground as dead. Oh, this is too much for me. I am under. And it is God who then gives us the grace to stand freely with confidence in His presence. It is God who then bestows on us the grace to become partners with Him in His mission. It is God, the same God, who invites us to be fully yielded to Him and that is our us becoming holy, separated unto God. Amen? So I want to invite you, me, all of us, to meet with this holy God. Amen? We've just started opening the door. A little bit. Take a little peek. Who is this God? Holy God. Holy, holy, holy is Jehovah God. He's holy. But the beautiful thing is He is inviting us into that place of being a holy people. And we're going to learn over the next several Sundays how God works it in us and then through us. Amen? Amen? Holiness is God's beauty. And David said, one thing I've desired of the Lord, one thing I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord and gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. I want to gaze upon His His holiness. His holiness. If you and I gaze upon His holiness, we will be changed into that same image. Changed into that same image. From glory to glory. Changed into the image of His holiness. His holiness being reproduced in our lives. Can we rise to our feet, please? And Call our worship team up this time. Let's take a moment just to gaze upon His holiness, to worship His holiness, to just begin to say, God, give me a revelation. This was my prayer. I was preparing and just saying, God, I don't want, I don't want this to be an intellectual thing. I don't want this to be an academic thing. God, I personally want a revelation of your holiness. I mean, I know we all know God is holy, but I want to create a revelation of that. I pray that you will ask God for the same thing. God, I want a revelation. Because if I can just see you in your holiness, then I will be drawn to it. 
because that's your beauty i will be drawn to it and it will be produced in me and revealed through me so let's take a moment to say god just help me understand help me see because you are glorious in holiness and words are not enough to articulate your holiness father even as we stand here this morning in your presence we ask you god for a revelation father of your holiness your sinlessness your perfection your purity speak to us in language that each of us can understand god and let it change us and it changes us and us just being willing to be set apart completely for the most holy one that's our holiness that's us being holy so father even as we stand in your presence do for us what you did for us i am god touch areas of our lives that need to be cleansed take the coal touch our lives our thought life our affections our appetites touch them that we might be fully set apart for you we thank you father that father i just pray your grace on each of us continue to open our hearts continue to open our eyes to your holiness may each of us personally receive god a revelation from your holy spirit on your holiness i pray this over each of us thank you in jesus name the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god our heavenly father and the sweet fellowship of his holy spirit be with each of us always amen amen we trust that this message was a blessing to you we would love to hear from you you can email us at contact@apcwo.org also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources thank you for listening and god bless you